I received a, a request to preach, I think it was Monday, from Hugh on the phone, and I wasn't sure, but I said, I, oh, I said yes, yes, Lord, I see that there. And, um, and I wasn't sure what to speak on, but uh, the next day I got an email from a friend, and uh, his name is Doug Horseman. And some of you may know he's a member of First Baptist Church in uh, Moncton. And he had sent me a, a, a short video, which I'm going to play at the very end of the service. And, uh, and I really feel that as I've been here this morning and listened and, uh, and, and listened to the songs that were being sung, that uh, the Lord is really in this. And he really has a message for each of us um, this morning. So I, I have two scriptures to read. The first is found in Psalm 150, at the end of the book of Psalms, or the Psalter, Psalm 150, and uh, it's a sort of a, uh, a crown of the Psalter in many respects. I call it a, a fireworks of praise as one comes to the end of the book of the Psalms. And uh, if I were to read this to you in Hebrew, it would be, uh, you would hear the name, uh, you'd hear the expression, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 13 times in the, t in the text. And hallelujah, it means praise the Lord. And uh, hallelujah is praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. And then at the very end, hallelujah, praise the Lord. So, uh, but it's, it sums up the Psalter, and it sums up this book of praises. And uh, it, it, it goes as follows. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And the second passage is from the New Testament. It's found in Luke 19, and we've been singing a bit about it. Hosanna, when Jesus uh, came into Jerusalem to make the triumphal entry. And the passage is found in Luke 19, verse 37 to 40. Luke 19, verses 37 to 40. When Jesus came near the place where the Lord goes down, where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They're praising him. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. God, may God add his richest blessing to his, his word. One of the things uh, my wife encourages me to, uh, and she's delighted to be with us today, um, um, she uh, encourages me to uh, try to speak uh, when I'm giving uh, one sermon to keep it to one sermon as opposed to four or five, actually. So I, I need to look at the clock uh, somewhere uh, to have my, um, put my phone there. It's 1127. So if we're out of here by one, we'll be fine, I guess. Okay, sorry. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to speak to you on the importance of praise. And I've called this in some ways uh, made to praise made to praise, or praise, not a matter of life and death, but a matter of life and breath. And the question I have for each of you as I begin, are you breathing? Are you breathing? I heard a joke once about a Baptist church where someone took a heart attack and the ambulance came and uh, they didn't know who to take out <laughs> because everyone was asleep. Hopefully, uh, everyone, one, at least one, most of the people were breathing, but the question is, are you breathing? And the breathing is um, very, very important to who we are. I mean, that's one of the, our vital signs. The question then is this, then, the, and, 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 and this will become really, really important in this message, 
The question is, are you praising? Are you truly living? Uh, and so I want to look at the importance of praise in the Bible. And so uh, I'm just going to figure out how to use this. So I go to the next one, and I guess I'm on that slide. Yes. Um, one of the great Old Testament theologians, uh, Klaus Vestermann, who's written books on the Psalter, has said this, only where death is, is there no praise in the Old Testament. Where there is life, there is praise. There cannot be such a thing as true life without praise. And so what he's basically saying, that somehow life is connected to praise. And I put the cemetery on there. I imagine if you drive through this area, you can see lots of these. I think maybe I mentioned this before, but uh, a few months ago, I was with uh, my brother, and we were out uh, at a restaurant with his uh, brother-in-law, who lives beside a cemetery. <laughs> and uh, he said, I asked him the question, I said, uh, what is it uh, like there? And before I even finished, he said, it's very quiet. <laughs> you know, it's very quiet. Because, uh, and this brings the Old Testament, you know, there is this idea somehow that death is the, the opposite of praise. And cemeteries in the Old Testament were the opposite place of the sanctuary where the people of God were gathered. The temple was the sphere of life. The cemetery always had to be outside the city. It had to be the place where it, death was. It was the opposite. It was the opposite of praise. Do you remember when Jesus went through that cemetery, that place of death, and he was the temple in a, in a sense of life, and he granted life to that demoniac who was living there, who was... Uh, besought by demons and disturbed and tormented. He was living in the place of death, but Jesus invaded that area and brought it life. And someday this whole planet, there's not going to be a cemetery anymore. This place is going to be filled with life. And so, the, but, but Vesterman makes an important point. Um, another theologian of the Old Testament, uh, Gerhard von Rod, says this, praise is man's most characteristic mode of existence. Praising and not praising stand over against one another as life and death. Praise, and this is interesting, praise is the most elementary token of being alive that exists. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament where God creates the man and he creates him from the clay and lifts him up to his his, his, his face, as it were, and breathes into him the breath of life. And man becomes a living creature. What is the most natural reflex? It is to breathe. Are we religious? Ask anyone if they're breathing. They're religious. Every breath is a religious event. And the most natural thing that to do is that we should be praising and thanking God for the breath that he's inhaled or basically breathed through us. And I, and I, have, this, uh, I have this picture, on those two slides on, the, on there, where you have an individual with an oxygen mask, and that's a sign of life. That the, the, but for, from the Bible, no, that's not necessarily a sign of life. What is a sign of life? Is people that are praising. People that are praising. That is the fundamental sign of life. And I think it's very, very important to see that. And that's why in the New Testament, it talks about this is the world of death. Uh, Paul looks out and, and he says, yeah, there's lots of people living. There's lots of people sort of going through the motions. But in a way, um, he said, we who were dead in trespasses and sin, God in his mercy was able to resurrect us to life, to change us from being centered in on ourselves, the world of death, to be able to be centered on God, the way of life. Do you remember the psalmist in Psalm 26 or 20, 28 says this, he says, Lord, if you don't speak to me, I'm like those who are, go down to the pit. And when Jesus was in the wilderness with Satan, she, Satan said, the most important thing you need, Jesus, is bread. You fasted for 40 days. Jesus said, no, the most important thing for me as a human being is this. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is why a human being lives. Man does not live on bread alone, but by everything 
that uh, proceeds from the mouth of God. In a way, we're gathered together here to hear a word from God to get life so that it might orient us, so that we might be directed to the author of life and be in tune with life. And that is the important point. Now, to to show you the importance of praise in the Psalter, it's important to look that the book of the Psalms is a, is a, is a five-fold book. It's, um, it's, it's, it's structured in five separate compartments or components. And, uh, and this is patterned after the Torah from the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In a way, the, the psalmists produced a Torah so that we could give it back to God. In other words, God gives us his word. Now we can give us the word that he wants. And so this book of Psalms is a book of hymns, of praise to God and prayers to God so that we might use them to return praise to God. Anyway, if you look through the Psalms, you will find uh, in Psalm 42 at the very, uh, 41 at the very end, it says this, Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, forever and ever, amen and amen. Right at the very end, you have this, it's called a doxology, We sing them in church, sometimes in churches where the offering is given. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That is giving God the honor for all of these gifts. That's why we're giving these gifts. We're giving him the honor. And so at the end of the first book of the Psalms, there's a doxology which is introduced. At the end of the second book of the Psalms, in Psalm 72, it says this, Blessed is his glorious name forever, and may his glory fill the entire earth. Amen and amen. So there's this movement, as it were, for the praise of God from the sanctuary to fill the entire earth. And then uh, Psalm 89 uh, says this, Blessed is the Lord forever. Amen and amen. And then... Uh, Psalm 106, 48, blessed is the Lord God forever and ever. Let all flesh praise him. Bre- praise the Lord, 106, 48. And then when you get to Psalm 145, verse 21, may my mouth speak the praise of the Lord so that all flesh might bless his holy name forever and ever. So at the end of the 145th Psalm, you have these doxologies which have separated the book of Psalms into five books. And then what you have is, after that, the praise starts to really crank up. At the beginning and ending of each psalm, after that, you get the expression, hallelujah, or praise the Lord. This never happens in any other group of psalms, except for this last group of psalms. So Psalm 146, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Psalm 146, 146, 10, praise the Lord. Then Psalm 147.1, praise the Lord. Psalm 148, uh, uh, 147 at the end, praise the Lord. 148.1, praise the Lord. 148.14, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Psalm 149.1, praise the Lord. Psalm 149. And then when you get to the end, you get this um, expression. Praise Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Cut loose. Let the whole universe cut loose with praise so that we can praise the Lord. So you get this 13 times, this reference. So what what there is in a sense, as you look at the book of Psalms, yes, it's broken into five books or five separate sections. And as it moves, you see this, as it were, movement to praise, which is taking over this book. And it's something for our lives. It's, this is written for our lives. Now, what, is, what does praise mean? We've talked a lot about praise, the importance of praise, all these things in the Old Testament. What does praise mean? Well, praise is very simple. It is, um, it is seeing a good quality and directing attention to it. Uh, Frederick Buechner says this, says this, we don't learn to praise by paying compliments, but by paying attention. So it's very simple. You live in some ways with your eyes wide open. You're able to see good qualities, and you're able to basically uh, um, um, 
draw attention to those things. Yes, that's amazing. I went for a bike ride last night uh, uh, down the, toward on the, uh, uh, on the Petticodiac. Uh, started at Chateau Moncton and went to the end. And as I was going through the sort of sometimes the tunnel of trees, and then as I would emerge, and as I would see the river, uh, and uh, I just thought, this is the epiphany of God. This is, this is God's world that he made. And uh, my mind, my, I, just, I just couldn't help but sir, praise God in my mind. Well, that's in a sense that, but we do it all the time. The first uh, two passages I want to look at, I, not very long, but Genesis 12, 15 is the first example of praise in the Bible. First example of praise. And in that, it's the first word which is used, praise. And it's always good to look at examples where the word praise is used in a more secular context so that we'll be able to understand it. In Genesis 12, 15, it says this, Sarah's a very beautiful woman. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, Abraham goes down into Egypt. The courtiers of the Pharaoh see Sarah and they talk up her beauty to the Pharaoh. So in a sense, what it is, it's the, it's the admiration of this person that they see her beauty and they talk her up to the Pharaoh. And of course, this gets, uh, uh, Abraham already is in trouble and it gets him in worse trouble. But the point I want you to see is that there is a, someone who was seen that uh, uh, has a sort of attention-getting quality and that person is talked up. The second one is another example. It's from 2 Samuel 14, 25. It's about the opposite. It's about a man, and his name is Absalom. And Absalom had hair that uh, was very different than mine, um, but he had hair that they said could weigh around five pounds <laughs> when he would cut it. <laughs> and uh, I know I shaved my head uh, uh, probably once every four months, and, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure it's not... <laughs> The hair is not five pounds. But anyway, it said here there was no man who was worthy of, uh, as it were, the women's attention in Israel as Absalom in terms of his actual physical beauty. He was someone who directed attention when he walked by. People turned around and looked because this was supposedly in ancient Israel's culture a man's man. Um, so the point is, he, he was talked about. He was, this quality was talked about. And so on a secular level, we can see what praise means. Um, and I, I put that uh, photograph or that, uh, that slide of, 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 of Rembrandt's self-portrait. And you'll notice the eyes. Eyes. That's, the eyes are huge. And that's what it means this is a very, very important part of praise. You observe and you're able to see. You're able to see. You're living in the world of reality. You're living with your eyes wide open, not closed shut. C.S. Lewis has got some of the most... It's a beautiful, beautiful little book. It's called Reflections on the Psalms. But it's one of the most... Um, powerful little books on praise. He's got this little subject, a little chapter called On Praising, and it's beautiful. In this, he says this, Many objects, both in nature and in art, may be said to deserve or merit or demand admiration. It was from this end, which will seem to some irreverent, that I found it best to approach the idea that God demands praise. I remember being at university and uh, talking a bit about praise to one of my uh, non-Christian friends, and he said, well, you know, that's terrible. God asking someone to worship him. I mean, if we thought about that with ourselves, that would be the ultimate egotist. Is God the ultimate egotist? And C.S. Lewis is dealing exactly with that point. And I remember saying, I, there's got to be something different with God demanding praise and me demanding praise. There's got to be something, and we'll look at that. He is that, but God is that object to admire which, or if you like to appreciate which, is simply to be awake. Is simply to be awake. 
to have entered the real world, not to appreciate, which is to have lost the greatest experience and in the end to have lost all or everything. The incomplete lives of those who are tone deaf have never been in love, never known true friendship, never cared for a good book, never enjoyed the feel of the morning air on their cheeks, never, I am one of these, enjoyed football. Our faint images of it. What would it be like, for example, if you walked through an art gallery and you saw the Mona Lisa and you just simply walked by? Uh, for some, there'd be something wrong with that. And it's, it's like this, what C.S. Lewis is saying, for you to walk through life in every breath that you're given, everything which is around you, and for you not to appreciate and to give thanks to the Creator, that is to live in darkness. And that's what he's basically saying. So praise in the real world. Praise in a sense, uh, praise... God is not the ultimate egotist. God is reality. God is reality. Um, and he is the one who is there and who basically says, look, this is the world that I've given you. Wake up. Wake up. Now, another point about praise is it's this, and it's already been hinted at. Praise is inner health made audible. In other words, people should know that you're praising. Uh, you know, when a person scores a goal, I remember uh, uh, when uh, uh, the Stanley Cup was, not the Stanley Cup, but the World Cup was won, the Olympics, actually, and Sidney Crosby scored that goal. If you just sort of kind of sat there down as a Canadian when the goal scored, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I think in overtime they said something like uh, none of the... Uh, they, they were able to show that uh, there was hardly anyone in the washrooms <laughs> in Canada. They had something to do with the waters that were of a, uh, that, 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 and I think between, before the overtime, they were, they were used all over the place. But when, they, when, when the overtime took place, everyone was there. And when that goal was scored, the, everything cut loose. Praise is inner health made audible. People should know that you're praising. And that's the important point, I think. That's why we sing hymns when we come. Why we, we express our praise. We, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we direct our praise. It's, it, it, we're healthy. Because in a sense, God is there and we're seeing that. Um, four problems. Four problems. No praise is a denial of reality. No praise is a denial of reality. There's something wrong when there's no praise, no expression of, uh, uh, of worth, as it were. There's something wrong. I remember uh, when uh, I coached the baseball team at Crandall, and uh, a few years ago, one of our players hit a home run, but it was becoming quite common for this person to hit a home run. So when... Uh, when he came in, the normal routine would be for everyone to be out there by home plate and to give him a high five. But everyone basically sat in the dugout and they uh, didn't, as if nothing had happened. And he came in, he said, what is going on? Uh, they were trying to actually uh, uh, make a statement about him. Uh, but the point is, that really wasn't reality. When you deny someone that kind of praise, which is rightfully theirs, there's something that uh, is, is wrong. Jesus said in that passage that I read, uh, in, it's also the, one of the parallels, is in Matthew 21, that, that somehow to deny him praise, the Pharisees said, you know, as Jesus came in, you know, tell your disciples to shut up. And he said, if I were to tell them to shut up, even the stones would cry out to praise you, Lord. So there's this idea, it's very, very important. The, the second point is insincere praise. We all know what that is. It's flattery. And it's, it's a denial of reality again. You're actually trying to get something from that person. And so you're flattering them. And that's not truth. That's not living in reality. The third one is boasting. 
and that is calling attention to yourself. Self-praise. Uh, but that's a denial of reality too. The psalmist or the writer of Jeremiah says this. He says this. He says, let not the wise man boast in his wealth, our wisdom. Let not the foolish or the, the strong man boast in his strength. Let not the rich man boast in his wealth, but let him that boasts or praise, praise the Lord. And why? Because he exercises justice, righteousness, and chesed, this covenant love in the world. And in these things I delight, not in these other things. In these things I delight. And the fourth point is this, idolatry. Idolatry is taking praise which is deserving of someone, ultimate praise, and directing it to something else. Giving too much praise to something or someone, that element has taken the place of God. John Calvin said this, the human mind is a perpetual factory of idols. And what is that? It's a denial of reality. Here's an example. I remember uh, watching the May Day parades in the former Soviet Union. And I don't know what they're like now, but this was like the, what they were like then. And what they did, they had thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands out in, in Red Square, and they were bringing their gods. They were bringing their gods, their military industrial complex, and they were showing it. And in a sense, they were bowing down. And I remember my dad telling me, you know, as a kid that they were atheists. And I said, no, they're not atheists. <laughs> There's no one who really is an atheist. They're actually God. They have a different God. And there's their God. Here's another one. I'm reading William Shearer's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. But this is at Nuremberg Square. And there were hundreds of thousands there when Adolf Hitler was a, an idol. He was an idol. And in fact, uh, essentially that whole culture, you know, there was a sense in which that idol seemed to promise life and truth, but all you had to look at were the desolated cities in 1945 and Hitler having himself committed suicide because he wasn't God. And he couldn't, an idol cannot produce. And that's the problem with an idol. It's a denial of reality. It's not real. Here's another one in our own culture. This is actually written, uh, produced by a guy. It cost him $3 million. It's a, it's, a, it's a statue, a gold statue, in an, almost like the golden calf of a supermodel. And we think of it in our culture where beauty and, uh, and the feminine figure is everything as you walk. This is a, a contemporary idol in our culture. And then this hits close to home. <laughs> We can make of these people idols very, very much. When in fact, all they are good at, really, in some respects, is uh, they're on, uh, they're, they have skates, they're on ice, and they're batting around with a stick, a piece of rubber. And they get paid millions and millions of dollars for this. And this is the status they get. But let's go to our text. <laughs> okay. And I just keep my eye on the my watch here. Okay, good. Um, the text is Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Who should be praised? The Psalter is absolutely clear. Look, praise the Lord. Praise him. Praise God. Praise him. 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 Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is the ultimate object of praise. God is not an idol. God is the th being that keeps us all together. God is the reason why we're here this morning. God is the reason why we're even alive this morning. God is the reason why this world exists this morning. If he were to remove his breath from this place, the whole of everything would collapse. God is the reason to be praised, and he is the God of redemption. And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, but let's look at uh, the fact that he is the one who is to be praised. And the psalmist is absolutely clear that, that when the last day comes, there will be uh, Jesus Christ on that throne. And that he will be, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the one to be praised. God is the one to be praised. The second, the where of praise. Where should praise happen? Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty, mighty heavens. Uh, our brother opened the passage from Isaiah uh, for praise this morning. Uh, in Isaiah, you get that idea of Isaiah coming into the sanctuary, the sanctuary where the people of the Lord gathered to praise. And what did they see? They saw, he saw this vision of God with the cherubim in heaven on his throne. And he was surrounded by these cherubim and they were saying, Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. He got an idea of what it was going to be like in that final day. And the whole point is, Isaiah's in the temple, God is in heaven with the angels praising him, and the idea is, I, I need to praise, I need to praise, I need to join in the chorus. But he couldn't because of his sin. But God looked after that by taking the live coal from off the altar and purging his lips so that he might join in praise. And what was his, what was his uh, response? Yes, Lord. <laughs> Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. I'm at your disposal. You're, you're not at my disposal. I'm at your disposal. You know, and so I can join in with the craze too. And so the, the idea here is that the very first verse of this, this passage, it's God is in heaven. The angels are called to praise him. Earth is recalled to praise him. And where is it on earth? The sanctuary. And I think it's very, very important in our culture today to realize that. The sanctuary is where the people of God gather together. There is a sense in which the whole earth is a sanctuary, that's true. But yes, where the people of God gather together and they help each other in the praise. So that when I'm singing and I'm not singing and I'm not feeling and I hear my brother or sister singing, they can encourage me to praise. And so that we, we gather together in community. We need each other in community. We, community is so important in our culture in the West, which makes an idol out of the individual. We need each other. And this is so, you, you realize that as a church, you need each other. I remember being here last, a few weeks ago, speaking, and, and the needs of the church were being met, uh, expressed. This is the body of Christ. The body consists of parts that need each other. We gather together. We're in community. And this is the point. Yes, yes, I'm an individual. Yes, but I'm part of a community. I'm part of a family. And uh, when one part hurts, the rest hurts. When one part is, uh, is celebrating, we all can join in the celebration. And here, heaven and earth join together in praise. The why of praise. Very simple, verse 2. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Wow. If we could actually begin to think, and this is some of the knowledge the psalmist didn't have, of the incredible things that God does in this world. And he was aware of the fact that he delivered his people from the oppression in Egypt. He was aware of how that God delivered his people from uh, the Assyrians in, in 701 BC. He, he was aware how he brought them into the land and how he gave them the land. He was aware of all these things. But there were some things he was not aware. I mean, the psalmist knew that the world was vast. But the psalmist didn't know of the incredible vastness of the world that we have today. Like, for example, if you go down to uh, um, Parley Beach and you take a, a grain of sand, you take that grain of sand, and in that grain of sand are more atoms than are grains of sands at Parley Beach. And God made those little worlds within worlds within worlds within worlds. This didn't happen by chance. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then if you expand and you go out past uh, the moon and Mars where we've put uh, 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 machines down, uh, spaceships down on there, and you go past our, uh, our solar system, and then you go to the first star outside our solar system, 24 trillion miles away. And then you start, it would take you 100,000 light years. If you, had, if you had a machine that could go at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 light years to grow, go across one 
one uh, uh, galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies beyond this. God's mighty acts. God is absolutely amazing. He's our creator. And so the psalmist makes that point. But you know, the psalmist makes this point. He's not only our creator. He knows his mighty acts. He says, you know, God has actually come into our history and he's heard the cries of his people and he's made a covenant with his people and he's actually lived, come and the psalmist didn't know that he would come and live among his people and he would go to the wall for his people so that he would we would be redeemed so that we could have fellowship with God, our creator. Now, how do we praise? Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. In other words, pull out all the stops. Pull out all the stops. And of course, this requires work, doesn't it? I mean, I can't just get a cymbal and pound it together. It requires work. It requires learning. It requires, you've got to learn to play the harp, the lyre. You've got to learn to do all these things. Um, but you've got to learn to play the trumpet. You've got to learn to do these things. There's an idea that God demands these things because God is worthy of the greatest choir. <laughs> God is worthy of the greatest music. God is worthy of the greatest of all these things. You know, one of the greatest musicians in the history of the world is uh, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. And at the end of every piece of music, he wrote this, Sola de Gloria, to God be the glory. And so this is the idea. He was wrapped up with God. But the point is, we pull out all the stops in our worship of God. God. God, in our worship, our worship, our praise, our singing, our dancing, all these things shows us that, that we want to celebrate God. That's the idea, very, very powerfully. Um, I remember uh, uh, reading a story about a guy, and I guess I lived this when I was at college, um, when classes were over and people were heading home, this guy turned his uh, uh, stereo just right up. And, uh, and he was so happy that the term was over. And uh, they asked him what he was trying to do, and he says, I'm trying to tear down the universe with sound. <laughs> and in a sense, that's what you have here at the end of the Psalter. The universe is to be torn down with sound as all the stops are to be pulled up. Why? Because this one is worthy. This, yeah, there are other things that are worthy, but this is the one that is worthy, the Lord God. Then the end. Who does the praising? Well, let everyone who is breath praise the Lord. The question is, are you breathing? <laughs> the question is, are you breathing? Then you should be praising. You should be praising. You should spring this up. You know, if you read the, the latter part of the psalm, you'll find all creation praising the Lord. You'll have the stars, the sun, the moon, all these various things have their, their own thing. But, but in a sense, it is an unspoken praise. It's an unspoken praise. Humans being made the image of God. We are given, as it is, in a sense, a great task. We are to be priests for the rest of creation. We are to basically articulate the praise of God in human voice for all the rest of creation. That's the idea that you have here. Now... Um, I just think it's so important to, to uh, how do we go from here? <laughs> well, I remember meeting a theologian from Czechoslovakia named Peter Kuzmik, and he said this, hope is the ability to hear the music of the future. Faith is the courage to dance to its tune in the present. So in a way, the psalmist is giving you the music of the future. Look, people, this is the way it's going to be. This is the going. What is the church? The church is a community of the end in the middle of time. We are the community of what it's going to be like at the end of time. And I know there's problems with that. But what we have to do is we get our act together. And the Lord, we, we, we have heard the music of the future. 
We have heard it. And what we have to do is we have to dance to its tune in the present. Um, a worldly lady came to uh, a guy named uh, Praying Hyde. He was named Praying Hyde. He was a Presbyterian minister because he prayed so much. And uh, she was at a party once, and she said, Don't you think, Mr. Hyde, that a lady who dances can go to heaven? He looked at her with a smile and quietly said, I don't see how a lady can go to heaven unless she dances. What he was basically saying, when God gets into someone, when God gets into someone, they, they, <laughs> it, they begin to move. When we were in Africa, uh, that was the thing in the Baptist churches where we went. Uh, the dancing was just absolutely contagious. That you were there and you moved. And uh, now I, I realize there's cultural differences, but the point is, the point is that people will know. <laughs> people will know that there's a there's a there's a, there's a tune to our step, and that's the point that's being made. And I put that picture of the cross, uh, not the cross, but the. The, uh, the empty tomb there. Um, and, uh, and there we have uh, Mary going and looking um, in the empty tomb, and the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. And why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus Christ has gone forth from that tomb. And you know where he's gone forth? He's gone forth. He's gone forth. And he wants people to experience the reality of what he's done. Forgiveness, cleansing, a new relationship. And in a sense, you remember what Jesus, I, I mentioned, remember what Jesus did when he uh, came forth from the tomb? He met his disciples. He met his disciples, do you remember? And he breathed in them the Holy Spirit. And you know what they were supposed to go and do? they were supposed to go and announce forgiveness in Jesus' name. Jesus, the great God, the great God who made us all, wants, to know, wants people to know that they've been forgiven, that they can experience the reality of fellowship and that they can have a new song in their heart, even praise to our God, so that when the Holy Spirit then goes in, he goes out into the world, and you know where he goes? He's here. He's in a, if you're a believer, he's in your life. The, the, uh, the apostle calls it Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isn't that absolutely amazing? I want to play you this little clip.
Let everything that has breath praise the Lord.